Do you accept it, Matthew? Great. Great. All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the workshop on real world legged locomotion. Uh, I'm excited today to introduce Matthew, who's going to be talking about Wondercraft and their exoskeleton they've developed over the years, multiple versions of it. Uh, Matthew has led uh, Wondercraft since 2013. Uh, and is the CEO as of 2018, but has led huge scientific teams or, or the scientific aspects and the, the technical aspects of, of Wondercraft for a long time, including raising money, but also guiding the vision uh, of Wondercraft as a whole. Uh, I personally have had the pleasure of seeing Wondercraft many times over many years now, uh, and they did something very unique uh, in that all of the other exoskeletons that existed on the market required crutches, used heuristics, but Wondercraft decided to do something that was, in my mind, incredibly courageous, which was to say, we want to have dynamic walking on an exoskeleton. And so the only way we're going to do that is by embracing the technologies that yield dynamic walking. So this, in my mind, is a wonderful success story of taking all of the methods that have been developed that this workshop's talking about, that all the papers in the area talk about, and translating it to a uh, application where it can really help people. So really, at the core of this device is dynamic walking and real-world legged locomotion realized in a way that can help people walk better. Uh, so I don't want to talk much further, but this is what makes this very exciting for me. It's a pleasure to work and collaborate with Matu. Uh, it's a pleasure to have one of their devices in my lab that we get to play with all the time. Uh, so with that, I'll let Matthew talk about the uh, device itself, uh, Wondercraft in general. So please take it away. Thank you very much, Aaron. H has anyone in the poll ever walked into his lab or his test room with this new ID that he was very, very enthusiastic about? working perfectly in simulation, and then launch the experiment and watch his robot miserably fall. And then you realize that someone just before you has, has changed just a little bit the controller or the software, or has added some kind of component that changes the behavior of the robot, and then nothing works anymore, and it's complete chaos. Have you? When I met Nicolas, uh, eight years ago, and he pitched me his crazy ID. I had absolutely no idea that this was going to be the biggest challenge I had ever faced. His idea was completely crazy, but also absolutely amazing. What if we could help the people that need it most get up, stand up, walk again, and wander freely, not only in their home, but all around the city? What if we could use and leverage the amazing potential of dynamic robotics and dynamic work to give them back the autonomy and the freedom they need? So right now, maybe you're wondering what are the, the things that connect these two stories. Well, Nicolas' idea was to create an exoskeleton that was going to help people work again. But if you think about it, one exoskeleton for one person is only useless. If you are going to really change the life of these millions of people, you have to have an exoskeleton that works for all of them. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you have to handle a very, very large variety of pilots. Because, and I think that's a blessing, people differ a lot in height, in weight, and people that need some help working again differ a lot in impairment. So you actually have not one model of an exoskeleton and a patient that you have to make work, but you have an almost infinite uh, variety of models. Some people um, are one meter and 50, and some are one meter and 90. Some meter weigh 100 pounds, and some people weigh 200 pounds. And that has a lot of influence on how uh, a person in an exoskeleton is going to behave. So because our idea was to have the biggest impact, we, from the beginning, we thought that we had to accommodate for all these different kinds of patients. So the first thing we thought about when we started designing Atalant, our exoskeleton, was 
how can we address at least 90% of the patients out there? So we looked at height, weight, spasticity, which is uh, uh, something that affects people uh, that cannot walk anymore, where their limbs are going to move by themselves, and, and the type of pathology that makes uh, walking very difficult. And as with every parameter, you have this Gaussian distribution where 90% of the person are going to be in a pretty narrow uh, bend. So we decided to have this, the exoskeleton um, work for all these patients. And then we had to think about how it was going to work. To work. So the idea is that um, we have to have patient information because we want to do something that really fits a given and a specific patient. Um, we designed a framework where we have this mobile app where you can input the information of the patient. And then the mobile app sends this information to our server where we have algorithms that run and generate trajectory and other kind of inputs that are required then on the exo to execute the motion. Our first exoskeleton, Atalant, is designed for uh, use in rehabilitation centers and medical settings. So it is to be used by physiotherapists or doctors um, to, be, to, to work again during re-education sessions and work sessions. Now imagine you are a physiotherapist. Your schedule of the day is probably six, seven, or eight patients. So you have to work fast, right? You've got this patient that you really want to get up again because he's been in his wheelchair for three or four weeks since his accident. So you think, nice, I have my exoskeleton. Um, I'm going to make it, him work. So let's take the mobile app and put the patient information in it and send it to Wondercraft and, and that's going to be tremendous. Now, how, how long can you wait for the inputs to come? You cannot wait, wait one day, right? Because you've got these six or seven other patients that you have to take care of after in the day. So you cannot even wait for an hour and, and you cannot wait for 20 minutes. It has to be less than five minutes. So one of the things we really, really worked hard at Wondercraft was designing algorithms that would be able to output trajectories and everything that's required for the care session and, and for the exoskeleton to work uh, very, very fast. And, and in this framework. So how did we do that? Well, as, as Aaron said, uh, we looked a lot at uh, all the papers out there and, and what were the state of the art methods and, and what was working and what was not yet working, but was very promising. And finally, we came up uh, with this strategy where, first of all, uh, we formulate the walk, but actually even the motion problem as an optimal control problem. So the, the, the goal is really to find the optimal trajectory under constraint. So for that, we take the full dynamical model of both the patient and the exoskeleton merged together. So that's something very important. Um, I know a lot of theories rely on reduced models. Uh, as a matter of fact, from the get-go, we decided that working with the full model made actually more sense because we had this information about the patient and we wanted to leverage that, to use that to provide better performance, uh, more stability, uh, and more anthropomorphic gait. So we merged the model of the patient and of the exo together to make a single model. This is taken into account uh, via mass, inertia, uh, and everything in, in a multi-body uh, model. And we also add all the physical constraints. So obviously, uh, torque, uh, everything that is related to the exoskeleton capabilities, but also everything that is related to the patient's range of motion. Uh, we don't want to go beyond what the patient is capable of, so it has to be uh, an input as well. Then we add the walk parameters or the motion parameters. So that's where there is a, quite a lot of know-how that we've developed over the years, uh, mostly working with the physiotherapists themselves and the doctors to understand what's a good gait, uh, what, what makes it really anthropomorphic, um, what is going to be comfortable for the patient, what is not going to be comfortable for the patient. So we had a lot of constraints uh, that, that make the problem uh, more likely to output uh, a good solution, something that's going to work on the exo, something that's going to be 
uh, good for the patient. And, and then uh, a lot of things ha happen. Um, so we use a, a direct collocation method uh, because we, find, we found it was very powerful, especially compared to single shooting methods that we were using in the beginning of Wondercraft. Uh, but at that time, it, it took three days approximately to output one trajectory. So that was something we were very proud at at the time uh, because that were, that were the first trajectories we were able to, to do. But as I, as I explained uh, previously, uh, it's not something that you can accept when you're a physiotherapist and, and you've got your device and you want your patient to work right. So we use this direct collocation method to discretize the problem uh, and, and it makes the problem in very high dimensions, right? Because you've got all these variables, position, velocities, accelerations, forces. Um, and, and so the dimension of the problems we then solve is something like 15,000, but obviously with a very sparse structure usually. So this allows us uh, to feed the problem to a numerical solver that is very efficient, with, especially with sparse problems. And we, we came up with solutions uh, that, are, that, that are able to be outputted in less than a minute. So obviously there is a lot of uh, know-how and, and tuning in, in that regard, because uh, that, that's not uh, very easy, but we've got a, a whole team here at Wondercraft that, uh, that's working on it. And then it's converted uh, in a trajectory format that's readable by the exoskeleton. Uh, we've got tools for analysis and visualization and making sure that we are not doing, uh, we are not sending things that are going to be unreadable by the exoskeleton. So this whole framework um, is working very well. And I, I, I know I already said it, but let me insist once again, it has to work for every patient that's susceptible to come in the exoskeleton. So, anyone from 155 to 190 and from 50 kilograms to 90 kilograms, his problem has to converge. So a lot of the work we do is actually making sure that all our algorithms converge for the whole database uh, we have at Wondercraft. And every now and then, I've got one, one person from the team who is going to come to me and say, but you, we've got this huge problem. Uh, our database only has a 99.5% convergence rate so it means that maybe one patient is going to come and we are not going to be able to find the trajectory for him. Um, and then we, we discuss together uh, what constraint can we change so we're going to go from 99.5 to 100%. Uh, and so, so it goes. So that, that's really the, the core of, of what we do at Wondercraft. And I, I guess your question then is, then what trajectories do you output? So the, we have put a lot of different motions because we want our patients to do a lot of things. The first thing we do is what we call small steps. So it's basically the, the basic work um, that's going to be used by a patient just to get uh, used to the exoskeleton with something that's very smooth, very comfortable, and uh, not too um, overwhelming as a first try. So here you can see Kevin, which is uh, one of the pilots of Wondercraft. Uh, he's completely paraplegic, so he cannot move at all by himself. And as you can see, um, he can walk without any assistance uh, in the exoskeleton. As you can also see, um, we've got this uh, rail above him. In case of uh, anything that, that could happen, uh, everybody knows that stuff happens to robots, um, so better be safe than sorry. But, um, this gate is uh, pretty efficient to get used to the exo. It's not extremely anthropomorphic, which is why we developed another gate uh, that we call foot rolling, uh, and you'll quickly understand why. Um, so this gate uh, is much more anthropomorphic because you've got this heel strike and this toe lift um, that closely mimic what a human gate actually looks like. So we've worked a lot on it, and it, it actually revolves around the formulation of the problem I was talking before, designing the right domain, uh, this is a multi-domain problem, um, and having the right uh, constraint uh, at, at each phase. But the result is a work that's much faster, that has longer steps, and it's really uh, much more anthropomorphic. So physio really like it when they see their patients uh, work like that. But obviously, it's much more dynamic as well. So 
at the moment, it's still necessary to be supervised by a, a physio. And we're working on stability uh, to, to make sure that uh, in, the, in the future, uh, that's not mandatory. Uh, and it's also not something you want to start uh, your rehabilitation with, because it, it's, if you've never worked before, uh, it can be a bit uh, overwhelming. And, and then we also have uh, what we call turnaround motion, because we want the exoskeleton to be really dynamic, and we want the patient to be able to evolve uh, in his old environment. So we want him to not only stay uh, in the rehab room, but wander in the, in the whole center uh, if he feels uh, like doing it. So you've got to be able to maneuver and to reposition yourself, and, and that's something we can do through this motion. And that's something that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, no other exoskeleton is able to do. So all this is uh, obviously interesting. And if you're thinking about it, uh, it's the standard framework of robotics. Um, you take a model, right? Um, you fit that to dynamic equations, and you have some kind of offline optimization. This optimization outputs a uh, trajectory that, that you have a certain set of properties uh, on. And then you send these trajectories on the exoskeleton or on your robot. You have some kind of tracking, uh, whatever that, that, that may be. And then you have the robots perform the motion. And, and in the end, you have human beings able to work without any assistance. So in itself, it's already pretty amazing. But um, there are limitations to it. And we quickly became aware of that. Um, first, the trajectories that you have uh, outputted only have this specific set of properties. So they have a, like an average gate, uh, gate speed, uh, step length, or, or direction. But what if your patient doesn't want to work at 0.5 meter per second, but he, he really, really needs to work at 0.56 or 55? Um, you could rerun the, 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 the trajectory planning, uh, but it takes a minute. So if you have to react uh, during the motion, you cannot rely on this, even this super fast algorithm. So we thought, what if you, what, what if you wanted to have a new trajectory, not at one minute, but in one millisecond, to be able to react to anything that's going to happen to you? So that was a, a direction we explored for some time. And, and we actually were able to do that uh, by introducing some learning uh, on top of what we do. So the idea was uh, because we can generate a lot of trajectories very fast, which is very, very, um, we, we give you a lot of uh, possibilities. We can generate a very big database of, uh, of trajectories for any kind of motion. And from this database, we can synthesize a neural network that himself is going to be able to output any kind of trajectories uh, very fast. So we submitted a, a paper that was uh, accepted at ICRA this year, uh, which is called the Online Trajectory Planning through Combined Trajectory Optimization uh, by Dubirk et al. Uh, so Alexi is uh, one of the, the person working at Pondercraft, and, and she wrote a really brilliant paper. Um, he was uh, uh, awarded the best uh, award uh, he was finalist for the best of our paper uh, at this year, so it's really an amazing paper, and I encourage everybody to, to read it because it's really, really good. And, and the, the result is that we are able to output trajectories in, in a time frame of the order of the millisecond. So that's very, very promising. Um, right now, we are not using this uh, at its full capacity. We are already using it uh, for, for some features on the exoskeleton. But we think there is a lot of potential uh, with this uh, ID because it, it's really the way you are going to be able to adapt to any kind of situation. Um, if you encounter a door and you have to make a, a shorter step or if you want to take a, a turn very fast or, or any given situation that requires that you adapt from your regular gate to a, a new set of uh, constraints from the environment, um, we think that's the way to go. Um, we talked a lot about um, height and weight, and that's the first thing that comes to mind. When you think about a person and how it can differ, uh, obviously these are the two parameters you think about. One other parameter that uh, is actually very, very important is the impairment of the person. 
some people that are going to use the exoskeleton have absolutely no residual strength. So that was the case of Kevin that you saw in the first video. But some of them actually have some strength. And, and even more than that, they can regain more strength. So how, how can you help them in their education? You have to engage them so that they provide some part of the effort during the motion. So we also worked uh, in a direction where we reduced the assistance that the exoskeleton is going to provide during the motion. So that took a, a bit of, of intellectual thinking because um, obviously you cannot just uh, get the gains down and hope that it's going to work well. You have to think of intelligent way to have the patient uh, inside the exoskeleton provide this, uh, this support. And we finally came up with a formulation where we can have the exoskeleton uh, assist at what we call 100% of the work. So that's what you're going to see in, in the first video. Uh, th this is uh, Stanislas, so he's one of the engineers here, here at Wondercraft. So he, he doesn't need the exoskeleton to, to work, but he can provide the effort if needed. Here, he's doing absolutely nothing, and the exoskeleton is going to work all by himself. So pretty interesting, but not that useful for, for him. But you can also get this percentage of uh, assistance down. And then you are going to see that the less Stanislas is doing e effort, the less the exoskeleton works very well. And actually, if he stops doing any effort, as you can see here, uh, the exoskeleton is going to stop completely. So that's very interesting for the physiotherapist because then they can adjust the percentage of effort that the exoskeleton is providing um, in relation with the status of his patient. Uh, is my patient very healthy and, and almost uh, almost fit to, to be discharged? Then I'm going to get the percentage down to almost 0%. If he's just out of his uh, acute phase and I really need him to, to be relaxed and very assisted, then I'm going to be at 90 or 95%. And, and, and you can do everything in between, uh, depending on, on the session, his state of the day, and, and a whole lot of other parameters that physiotherapists would tell you much better than, than I can actually. Okay, so that's for patients, right? But Wondercast vision is not to provide um, an exoskeleton just for rehab centers. Our idea from the beginning, and, and that's what Nicola told me when I, when I joined him, was that we could really use the technology to get people out there in the city, in the real world. So how do we prepare for the real world? We were actually lucky enough to find a, a contest, which is called Cibaton, um, which really put a lot of thought in, into designing um, challenges that are representative of uh, what patients encounter in everyday life. So they, they designed a whole set of contests and, and challenges that represent what we, you need to overcome in order to really get to an inclusive solution. So this was so closely aligned with what we were thinking about that we really jumped on the occasion and said, okay, let's prepare for the Cibatlon, not, not in order to win, but actually in order to improve ourselves and our product. So this kind of um, put the whole team in effervescence um, because we started working on it pretty late in the race. Uh, Cibatlon is actually something that happens every four years. And we um, entered the contest, I think, less than eight or nine months before it started. Um, so everybody has to, had to be very quick and, and, and think fast. But with the help of the framework we designed, um, we were able to start doing a lot of the tasks pretty quickly. That's, that's how powerful the framework is. It means that you have a new motion to, to perform, uh, like like, let's say, stairs or walking through a door or, or walking up a, a, a cliff. Uh, it, it's pretty quick to, to have motions going. So rather quickly, we are able to design motions to get upstairs. And the first motion you're going to see is Yurik, which is the, the second pilot uh, at Wondercraft. He's also completely paraplegic. And with the single help of Atalant and his arm, uh, he's, he's using the, the, the lift, um, he can get upstairs. So that was something that we are very happy about because when we started and designed Atalant, 
uh, stairs were not even in the specs of the of the product. That was for the next product uh, that was supposed to go in real life. But actually, uh, we are able to get people upstairs and, and pretty repeatably. So that, that's very exciting. The other thing uh, we are able to do was uh, a lot of maneuvering that, has re that is required to really evolve in, in, in real life. So here you can see Guillaume, uh, one of the engineers uh, from the team, um, trying to go through a door. So when you think about it, it doesn't look like much. But if you really want to walk through a door, you have to be able to do all these kind of maneuvering motions, like uh, turning around and, and slightly adjusting your position. And here you can see him uh, getting backward actually through the door. And we were able to implement all these motions on the exoskeleton. And again, that was uh, something like three or four months of work. Um, one of the other contests that Cibaton designed was being able to get up from a, a very soft uh, standing point. Uh, so we've got this sofa, which is very low on the ground. So it requires uh, quite some uh, trick of the mind to think how, how are you going to get up. Um, and we were able to do it by, by really leveraging the dynamic aspect of the motion. As you can see, um, we really use the motion of the torso of Kevin to provide some momentum for the exoskeleton to, to get up. So that's something that we've put a lot of emphasis on, is getting the best out of the dynamic uh, of motions rather than having this static um, way of thinking where you are going to force and, and use a lot of torque to, to try to control it. Rather, go with the momentum and, and use the momentum because it's going to help you in, in the end. Um, Obviously, you also, if you are going to evolve uh, in a real life setting, you need to be able to handle perturbation. So one of the benchmarks we use here at Warner Park to test the robustness and the stability of our algorithm is this exact setup that you are seeing right now. Um, we put a dummy, uh, I think it's from the automotive industry, uh, and they use it for crash tests. Um, uh, we put a dummy in the exoskeleton, because we know the dummy is not going to perturb or, or do anything that we are not being, going to be able to control. Uh, experiences with the dummy are, are not perfectly repeatable, but we know that the dummy is not helping at all. So that's kind of our benchmark. And our uh, target here on this experiment was to reach 1,000 steps because we thought that if we are going to, if we could reach this level, um, probably it, it was able to work uh, indefinitely. And, and as you can see, um, with this last algorithm that we've been trying uh, on the EXO, and they are pretty recent, uh, it's the work of really the, the, the last two months, we're able to have a gate which is extremely stable. Um, we're able to push the dummy and, and to do all kinds of perturbations in all directions uh, without uh, getting him to fall. Uh, there are still some stuff that we need to handle uh, which are related to direction. Um, the, the dummy is not able to correct for direction itself, so we have some, somebody doing it in, in his sense. But really, we have uh, this, this very high stability that we're very happy about, and, and that really makes us think that it's going to be a thing, exoskeleton, uh, in, in the city. It's not something that we cannot achieve, the kind of stability that's required to evolve uh, in the streets and, and everywhere around. Um, it's something that, that we can do. So th that, that's, that's what I wanted to, to end the, the, the talk um, with. It's that we really had this vision from the get-go that we were going to use dynamic robotics and, and to give back mobility to everybody that, that, that needs it. And one of the biggest challenge we faced was really this um, need to adapt to every different patient. That's that's something that's very, very difficult. Uh, and that's why I wanted to start with this question because I, I think everybody can relate to, to this uh, setting where nothing works because something has changed uh, something uh, before, before you. And that's actually the case. If you work at Wondercraft, you have to think that each time a new patient gets in the exo, everything you fight tune for another patient is not going to work. So you have to have this mindset where your work has to be robust to any perturbations coming from the model. And that's the model of the patient, right? 
but in some sense, it also translates to perturbation to the model of the environment. And that's why I think this challenge was obviously very difficult, but was also an opportunity and a way to force us to confront the whole complexity of the world and, and to design algorithms that then would be robust to perturbation from the outside and, and who would finally and eventually work uh, in the real life. So that's, that's it for me, I guess. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the audience. Um, or from you, Aaron, uh, as you see it. Thank you, Matt, too. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, so for the audience, what we'd like to do is, if you have questions, please put them in the chat window, and I'll read them to you, Matt, uh, So we have a couple of questions to, to kick things off. Uh, the first one is, and, and I think I'm, I'll try to get this right, but uh, so if personalization of gate is the goal, um, and you know, you talked a lot about doing optimization and generating dynamic motions for the gate. Um, how do you get, plan on handling personal comfort issues related to the gates that you're generating? So each person has a different comfortable trajectory. How do you, or what are the plans to factor that into the picture? So, so actually, I think you would be the, 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 the best person to answer this question. Um, I, I, I think a lot of uh, the person in the audience um, have read the, the paper that uh, Megan and yourself have, have submitted to Alcra. Um, actually, we, we know that there are methods um, where you can learn uh, gate preference based on, on what the person is doing inside the exo. So we, we don't see it as a problem to have a, a, a specific, uh, like generic set of constraints because then it's going to, it's still going to output a motion that's specific to the person, but maybe he or, or she would have preferred other things. But then you can have a um, mechanism on the exoskeleton, which are going to learn the preference of the specific person in the exoskeleton mm -hmm. and adapt slightly after he has worked um, mm -hmm. on the exo. But one thing we could even do, and that's also something the, the team has been, uh, working on is actually um, design some meta work, some meta learning algorithms where you are going to learn what the learning algorithms would actually co co come up with. So mm -hmm. then we wouldn't even need this phase of uh, learning uh, the, the preference of the person, but mm -hmm. we could from the get-go, based on the person itself, uh, know where his or her preference uh, would lie in the end. So, so I really think it's all about uh, having this uh, stand the initial gate and then uh, adapting to, to the person. But you have to have the initial gate or the initial motion. I completely agree, having thought of this problem, as you said. I think once, and the thing is, once you have this basis of trajectories, as a basis of, uh, you know, surface of dynamic walking gates, you can pick in that surface, right? So you're not just generating, when you have the ability to, to rapidly generate walking gates that are dynamic, you're not just generating one, but you can generate thousands and, and you can parameterize them and then decide within those what the best one is. So you really are giving your, the patient, ultimately you're giving the patient the ability to pick between a bunch of different gates and you can do things like preference-based learning like we did and a variety of other methods to try to decide which of those gates they actually like the best. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I completely agree. All right. Let's get to the, we have other questions, so let's, uh, oh, uh, so it was asked, could actual skeletons be affordable in the, in the near future? So the question um, of cost. Yeah, so, so I guess it's, it all uh, depends on what you call the near future, right? Um, at Wondercraft, we strongly, and, and I, I really mean the word strongly, um, believe that the cost could be less than that of a car. And we know billions of cars are on the planet and that's something we are trying to get rid of because it's not so healthy for the planet. But in the case of exoskeletons, we actually think it would be extremely healthy to have millions of them uh, because it would also mean millions of people uh, able to get back to work in some cases, able to just get out of their homes and, and get down to the bakery and, and if they're French and they love their baguettes, uh, bring it back home. Um, so, so really, we really think the social impact of, uh, of having millions of exoskeletons would be extremely positive and extremely high. And having millions of exoskeletons 
will no doubt uh, get the cost down to something that's very affordable. And, and when I say a car, uh, actually our benchmark at Wondercraft uh, is actually more that of a motorcycle because, because it closely resembles uh, in terms of complexity, number of parts, and total volume. Um, that's something we really have in mind. So for, for the moment, obviously the cost is very high. Um, uh, I, I'm not here to, to give you a price, but obviously tens or hundreds of thousands of euros uh, to build an exoskeleton. Um, our target is to make it very, very lower, uh, very much lower than that. And, and so it means in, in the very low tens of thousands of euros or dollars. Very good. Uh, next question is, would it be advantageous to build a lookup table of dates instead of optimizing on demand? So the question is sort of why not just generate all possible dates for all possible people and all possible parameters in this huge database and just pull from that rather than optimizing on demand? Well, well I guess um, in a way uh, it's not possible because it's the curse of dimensionality. So you, you, have, you have to make choices. And in another, in another sense, it's actually exactly what we've done, right, with this uh, neural network. So, so I think it's not possible to generate uh, any single gate. And actually, you've got uh, some issues uh, with uh, embarking the whole uh, database uh, on, a, on, on a single exoskeleton and a whole other set of, of things. Um, but I think it's possible to generate just enough gates so that you can reconstruct uh, anything you would be likely to want uh, in the future. So, so the whole, um, let's say, the whole trick or, or the whole the, the whole complexity or the difficulty is really understanding what kind of uh, gate you need to generate to be in your database, um, and what other you can afford not to have generated because it's going to take a lot of uh, computing power and time and, and resources. Uh, so, so you can have uh, in the end what you what you want. So, yeah, very good. Uh, so the next question is: the people that you showed uh, in the videos were mostly fit. Uh, have you done clinical trials or or testing with people that are less fit, um, meaning less out of shape, overweight, etc. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a good question, and it actually um, is exactly in, in, in what I was talking about, about uh, handling a very large variety of patients, right? We want to, to handle the, the, the largest uh, part of the population that, that might be likely to want our exoskeleton. So we've done some clinical uh, trials. Um, we're actually running our third clinical trial uh, approved by the uh, health authorities. Um, during the first two, we had a different, different kind of person, so different kind of ages, uh, different kind of morphologies, and different kind of, of fitness. Um, obviously, um, so, so it wasn't the case in the videos, but we had, we had people uh, go all the range uh, that I showed previously. So we had people uh, at 90 kilograms. We didn't have anyone above that weight because uh, that, that's the specifications of the exo. But we had people up to that uh, weight, uh, and it worked, uh, I would say, not differently from, from, from here. Another thing that, that comes to mind is, is not only weight, but also impairment. As, as I said, that's something very important uh, when, when you're talking about patients, because patients, just after their accident, uh, let's say if they have a stroke or something like that, are much weaker uh, than, than after some time. And we've been able to have in the exo patients that were uh, still severely impaired uh, by, by their incident. And that's actually one of the points that uh, we really emphasize when we talk to, to doctors. And, and at the beginning, they don't really believe us. Um, uh, let, let me tell you a story about that because I, I think it, it, it's funny. Um, we recently hired uh, an MD in the team. Um, she's called Rebecca, she's uh, amazing. Uh, very young, but also very talented. Um, and she's been practicing med the medicine in a rehab center, a uh, rehab center we, we know. Um, so she joined the team, I would say three months ago, uh, during the lockdown, so not ideal, but uh, we had to make it work, right? Um, 
and, and a couple of days ago, we sent her to one of the rehab centers we work with, uh, one of the rehab centers that has acquired uh, an exoskeleton, uh, one version of Atalant. And she discussed with the medical staff there, and, and the medical staff uh, wanted to try the exoskeleton with not a paraplegic uh, patient, but a tetraplegic patient. So really uh, paralyzed up to, to, to the next. Um, and so I, I, knew, I knew Rebecca had, was gone for the day. And when she came back, uh, uh, she, she looked very happy. So I asked her what had happened. Um, and she, she actually told me that she was so happy because she had seen this tetraplegic patient uh, walking the exoskeleton. And I, I really liked the, the smile on her face. But I, I, I didn't really understand because that's not something that took um, so surprising to me. And so, so I thought, so why, why are you smiling like that? And she said, I, di I didn't believe that he was going to walk in the exoskeleton. So, so she's from the team and she even didn't believe that it was going to work. And actually it worked uh, very well and the whole team, uh, the medical team was very happy and she was happy. Um, but ju just, uh, just to emphasize the fact that with Atalant, uh, you can get patients that are really at, early in their education or, or not long after their impairment or accident. And you can, can do things with them. You can get them up, you can walk, uh, you can perform exercises. Uh, physiotherapists love to have not only walking uh, sessions, but walking and doing other things, what they call double testing. Um, so sorry for being that long. Uh, it was a, a broad question, so, so I wanted to give the full perspective. Um, but yeah, we've been doing clinical trials and, and having a large variety of patients uh, use the exo. So let me let me ask kind of a, a, a follow, another question that's in the chat window, but it's sort of a follow up. Is um, do you think the number of joints you have on the device, active joints, uh, uh, motors, uh, are sufficient? Could be reduced? I mean, are they sufficient for the question was are they sufficient for completely disabled people? I think you were just talking about this in the story. And could they re be reduced in certain scenarios? Could you imagine variants with more or less motors, actuators, depending on the, the uh, specific condition, medical condition? That, that's a good question. Um, actually, we've been uh, testing uh, architectures with less degrees of freedom. So we, we, last year we had a prototype with uh, not 12, but eight degrees of freedom. And maybe we're just not strong enough. So, so, the, so the answer is, is maybe, but I'm not good enough for that. And I don't think the team is good enough um, to be able to give the same level of performance with less degrees of freedom. So right now, um, my feeling is that we are even maybe lacking um, uh, one, one degree of freedom or one or two degrees of freedom because one essential part of uh, walking is the toe push at the end of the uh, uh, of when the foot is, is, is lifting off and we cannot do that because we don't have the degrees of freedom in the toe so my feeling is that um, all of them are necessary and actually even a bit more unnecessary to provide real uh, work and real um, resistance to perturbation. Uh, but maybe I'm just not good enough. Uh, I, I don't know. The, 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 other, the other point is, have you, do, do you know how many muscles, muscles there are in the human body? How many what? How, how many muscles um, do you have? Oh, in muscles body? in the body? Yeah, I have no idea. It, it's, it's in the hundreds. Yeah. So, I don't know. So, so maybe some some people are, are good enough to, to make it work with less. Um, I, I don't think I am. It's a, it, I think the thing is that you might be able to reduce the number of actuators for, for a given motion. For example, for walking, you might be able to have less, even dynamic walking, even for paraplegics. But that's for walking in a straight line right with no perturbations i think anytime you're talking about having a certain level of functionality in a variety of different environments as you said we have a lot of muscles and we don't really need all those muscles all the time but if we're going to do everything we want to do throughout our lives we end up using 
most of those muscles, right? Uh, in some way, yeah. shape, or form. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that the, the question is is a very complicated one because it depends on on what are you trying to achieve, in what environments are you trying to achieve it, and and uh, you know what the proper architecture is to achieve those goals. Um, but yeah. Uh, and and uh, another aspect of that is when you talk to physiotherapists and doctors, um, usually they, they really think, obviously they think about their patients, uh, right, that, that, that's their um, everyday life. Um, and they want the, the, whatever the device is to engage uh, most of the muscles of the patient. So, so they, they don't want some muscles to be uh, just left like that and, and never touch or, or never use. They, they want to be able to activate um, all the parts and, and all the muscles of the patient. So in this, um, in this sense, I think it's not a goal uh, per se to reduce the number of actuators. I, I don't think like that. Um, I, I don't see why it should be uh, a target to, to have a low number of actuators, except that it's going to bring the cost down and, and, and maybe the overall uh, volume of the of the device but you you have other strategies to do that right so so because i don't see it as a goal uh i, I rather see having the best device as, as the goal um I, I don't i don't really try and push the idea of reducing the number of degrees of freedom yeah i actually think that's right because i think you will end up converging on the numbers you have actually um I, yeah, no, this is a good, uh, good summary of these different issues. Uh, so slightly different bend on just number of actuators and patients, but going to the assistance needed uh, capabilities, the question is uh, uh, to what, what type of signals are you looking at when, when you're interfacing with somebody and giving them some authority to walk, meaning you're giving, you're doing some assistance, uh, but taking away the exo assistance and letting them do some of the effort themselves. Um, what signals are you looking at? What uh, what uh, what sensing do you need? Ah, okay. like, what's the important? Like, what's the interface look like? I guess this is the question they're asking. So so so, so what what do we base the the assistance on, right? Um, well, a, a number of things, but obviously um, seeing the perturbations uh, the patient put uh, in, the, in the motion, in the overall motion, is a big part of it. Because if we know the motion is supposed to, to, to look in, in, in a certain shape, and we see it doesn't uh, behave like that, we know that the, the patient has to, has to have done something, right? Uh, it's probably because he's done some kind of effort in, in some kind of direction. And using that, we can see if he if this effort is in the right direction or not. So the the, the whole idea revolves around the fact that we try to see in which direction the patient is doing the effort, and and also in which direction we hope he is going to do the effort because we want him to follow a certain trajectory, um, and and based on that we are going to help him uh, a lot if he has a lot of assistance and and almost none. Um, if we, if there is no assistance, um, to do that and for it to be efficient, you have to have the the most transparent uh, mechanism uh, because he, he cannot be pushing against the inertia of the exo or against gravity. So you have to have compensating mechanisms on on the exoskeleton that are going to enable the patient to do this effort and, and to have this effort uh, sent in a way. So. I, I hope it addresses the question. Um, if not, please, please send me and I can try some more. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that I, I think that was good without going through the entire process. Um, in fact, there's a related question, so maybe I'll jump to that. Uh, the question was, it's a little bit about the hardware side. So first, how do you sense patients trying to move within the device itself? What's the interface right now with the patient? And uh, also, what's the battery life like on the XO, uh, how long can it run without needing to be charged? So some hardware questions. Okay, um, so so we've got uh, obviously we have some information on what happens at each uh, actuator uh, level 
because we know how much uh, current is, is grown and, and used. Um, so that gives us a, a whole lot of information. And we also have sensing capabilities in the foot of the exoskeleton. So we know when there is a contact, uh, where and, and with how much weight uh, or pressure on it. Um, so th this helps us uh, navigate the, the support frame uh, at any given time, which is obviously very helpful to perform dynamic computations and, and understand what, what the, context, the context of uh, working. Um, and we also have some uh, inertial uh, measurements. So uh, we are able to reconstruct uh, rather precisely uh, the overall position of, of the system and, and the, the, how, how it's behaving. Um, so, so that relates to the, to the sensing capabilities, I, I guess. Um, the other question was regarding battery life. So my answer, uh, if I were to talk to, to, to physios, would be, uh, enough so you can perform all your sessions with your patient. Um, the, the engineer uh, answer, I guess, is, is between 1.5 and, and 2 hours of uh, hard uh, or, or really intense uh, motions and, and exercising. So you can walk uh, no problem uh, for at least uh, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then the batteries are very easy to, to change and plug and play. So in the end, it's, it's not that much of, a, of an issue in a rehab center uh, version. Obviously, the personal version will need to be a, a bit more, um, but yeah. yeah. But for, from the engineering side, it's very easy having only one of these. I know, I mean, because the batteries are on the front of the thighs, basically, of the XO. So you can pop them yeah. off, charge them, pop them back on, which is actually kind of brilliant. Most of the, I mean, a lot of robots, you have to take them apart to get the batteries out, and that kind of doesn't make sense. Right? Um, so, all right, so I'm going to close up with, we have about four minutes left, so three more questions, because um, I think these are all good questions. Um, and so the first question is, uh, do you imagine more elaborate ways of interfacing with the human down the line? That is, you could do um, muscle stimulation in conjunction with the exoskeleton and then try to use some of their own muscles, right? Do you imagine um, um, neuro or bio uh, interfaces between the device and the people and, and the person, the patient going forward? Uh, actually, that's a very good question. Um, and and, and I, I don't have the, the complete answer to that, um, except that um, there is no method that is going to work for every single patient. Um, I was talking earlier about a, a tetraplegic patient that has used the exoskeleton. Um, one of the ways you trigger the motion uh, when you're in Atalant is by moving your torso. So obviously, in the case of this tetraplegic patient, uh, he couldn't do that. So the, the medical team had to do something very um, uh, astute. <laughs> um, they, they, move the, the trigger uh, somewhere around the head, and so he can uh, uh, use it uh, and trigger the motion. J just to emphasize that, um, if you're talking about uh, muscle sensing or, or electro stimulation, uh, it's not going to work on paraplegic patients because the, the signal just doesn't get through uh, at one point. So it's not going to work for, it, maybe it's very efficient for some kind of patient, but it's not going to be uh, efficient for, for some other, and that's, that works as well uh, for, for the solution we've chosen, uh, inertial uh, uh, strategy comment. Um, so I, I think at some point we are going to have to customize uh, a little bit the exoskeleton so that uh, we have one solution for one kind of, uh, of patient or one type of pathology and another that works well with, with another. But that's actually something that makes the device much more complex so we've got uh, very, very intense discussions right now uh, in the engineering team uh, regarding how and, and what we should do for, for different uh, pathologies. Because right now, uh, we only have uh, complete paraplegic patients uh, that have been, let's say, validated uh, by, by regulatory um, agencies. But uh, quite soon, we are going to have also stroke patients and incomplete paraplegic patients. And, and I, I hope a lot more in the coming year. So, so that's something we're going to have to address. I don't think there is a single solution that works for everybody. That's, that's my answer. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that is true too. 
Um, so the next question about future capabilities. Uh, what about more dynamic behaviors than you even have? So running or, or jumping or what do you see possible? Um, I, actually, I had this very discussion with someone of the team, uh, I think this week. Um, I, I think it's feasible to jump right now with that alone. <laughs> um, the, 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 the tough part is rather landing, right? So, so obviously we want to increase the, the, the dynamic uh, capabilities of the, of the EXO and we are working right now on a new prototype uh, that's going to be way more dynamic. Um, uh, we're really working harder on that. So uh, it's going to be way more reversible uh, in the actuations and, and have uh, higher capabilities. Um, the, the trick is being dynamic enough uh, to to handle every situation, but not too dynamic uh, that you are going to scare patients. That, that's something we've seen before. Uh, patients are not accustomed, uh, if they've been in the wheelchair for three or four months, um, already getting and standing up is somehow, um, for, for some of them, uh, a bit exhilarating. So, so we have to be careful and really um, get them in a setting where they're comfortable. So, so I don't think uh, jumping is, is the, the, the first thing we would um, go to. Um, already mastering steps and thresholds and being able to go in the street uh, would be very important. And, and one more thing would be to be able to get in a car. I, feel that thing, I think that would be very, very useful for our users. Yeah, very good. All right, so the final question, which is the, the one I think it's good to close on is, uh, what's the availability of the device? Is it available to non-medical uh, professionals? Is it generally available public, you know, to researchers, okay. et cetera? What's the availability? So, okay, so obviously it's available for any medical institution. Um, our goal and the, the whole team uh, is working so that we can help the maximum number of patients. So any medical institution in the world, in the world uh, we're happy to see if we can work with them. Uh, there are always uh, regulatory aspects involved, so, so we have to clear that. Uh, but we, we are willing to provide access to Atalant to the biggest number of patients. For non-medical um, institutions, uh, that's also something we can work on. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, you, you have a, a, an, a, an Atalant uh, at your own lab. So if we think um, the, 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 the robotic team uh, is interested enough, uh, that's something we can discuss. Obviously, that's not our main uh, business model, so it, it's kind of a... Um, say, uh, yeah, yeah it, we, we have to, to see how and, and if it can work. Mm -hmm. uh, but Atalant is very easy to use. Uh, you've got the, we, the, the, the last version we have uh, works with a, a tablet uh, uh, that's really easy to use, so, so there are not, no, not many problems. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Well, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll end our uh, special session. Thank you for giving a fantastic talk and for answering a bunch of interesting questions on the next steps for exoskeletons. So Matthew, thank you so much for being here virtually. Um, thank you everyone that attended and with that, uh, we'll uh, go on to study more exoskeletons. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Aaron. Have a good day and thank you everyone for attending the session. Thank you, Aaron. Um, just a quick uh, note. Um, so, we are not sure about the tomorrow's talk. It might be postponed. So please stay with us and check on our website where tomorrow's talk is going to take place. So thank you very much once more. Okay.